All right, everybody, we are live. We are here this evening for starting the recording button. All right, everybody, and we are live. Just say it. now it's on the recording there, too. <laughs> <laughs> um, just want to say thanks, everybody, for tuning in today. This is Yawa episode 53. Is that right? Yes. Yes, 53. it is. Or at least that's what the thumbnail says, so I'm going with it. <laughs> and I uh, do have to regret to tell you, you guys just missed our um, guest star of the evening. Yeah, it was his bedtime, though. Yes. So I was sitting up, checking everything out, right? And Aiden comes in, and I'm like, all right, buddy, hop up here in mommy's seat. And we put the headphones on him, and I moved the microphone down to his, and it's like, all right, bud, talk into the microphone. He goes, talk, 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 talk. The only word he could come up like, with to say. You can say anything at all. What do you want to say? Talk. <laughs> like, okay. It was pretty cute. He had a lot of fun. He was enjoying listening to himself and talking because, I mean, it's cool. I don't I don't know if you guys have ever had the opportunity. This is not the highest end equipment in the whole world, but it's nice equipment. And when you talk into it and you have the headphones on, it's like, ooh, I sound like an announcer. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah. Or, or you just make that announcer voice. So. Yeah, it's pretty much just me, I think. So, like we have talked about in the past about our... Yeah, I was. I'm just going to cut him off and start nah. on stuff. Um, we have had split personalities. No, we have had split input on people that like the live version of Yawa and people like the all-in-one pre-recorded version of Yawa. So we are trying to do a little bit of both. We, Ethan and I, really truly enjoy interacting with you guys and seeing your live comments pop up and see where you guys are all checking in from and but we respect the people that want the other version so we're doing a little bit of both last week was alive this week's alive next week won't technically be live we're going to pre-record it but it's going to go live-esque at 7.30 on Wednesday, Central Standard Time so that people can kind of get into a groove and a routine of when to expect these shows to go out every and Wednesday. Yep. When we're able to, we're going to also try and pop on as far as the commenting so that we can try and interact with you guys to that level as well. Yeah. So when we aren't available to do lives, we'll have the pre recorded versions, premieres, and we'll be able to there still, if at all possible, to be able to interact with y'all on Wednesday nights at 7 30. Let's go through a quick check-in. Who all is here? I've got a few that popped in here. It William says, Chesson was here at 7.04 waiting on us. Heck yeah. He said he loves our information. How do I send my Brittany for training? Go ahead and send us an email, and then we can get you some extra information about that. Um, Kat at standingstonekennels.com or Ethan at standingstonekennels.com. We can help you out. Yep, those work perfect. Shane. We, oh. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Shane Tuft said, Yawa, I'm trying to get my Brittany puppy on a good dog food. What brands would you recommend for me? Ammo's 13 weeks old. P.S. Hope the bourbon is good tonight. Ooh. So while I'm going into detail about talking about good options for dog food, Ethan can go into bourbon detail. Mm-hmm. 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 dun 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 this, let's put that up there close so you can oh, see. Oh, yeah. John J. Bowman. Now, I want to explain because it gets confusing, especially a lot of you I know are, are excited about bourbon, kind of getting into it because you see that I have or trying to expand your horizons based on what you see me sipping on. Um, and I want to point out a couple things. A lot of bourbon barreled, bottled, uh, bo- bottles of bourbon... Dirt, dirt, dirt. Um, a lot of bottles of bourbon have very, 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 very similar labels, okay? And this would be one of the brands that specifically does that. Now, if you look on here, it says, uh, whoop, there we go. John J. Bowman, Pioneer Spirit, Virginia Straight Bourbon Whiskey. And then the important part right down there at the bottom, single barrel, okay? They also have a small batch 
And then they have a... Hmm, I know for sure that they have the small batch and the single barrel. And the single barrel happens to be the better one, okay? Small batch, and, and this is just a little tip of the thing, and then we'll move away from this, but... Essentially, if you have a small batch type of bourbon, it's a bunch of barrels that are kind of mixed together to have a very similar flavor, uh, as well as bigger batched bourbon is more that way to, to the extreme, essentially. If you look at like something like, uh, I don't know, just Crown Royal or Jack Daniels or something. I mean, Crown Royal is not bourbon, but a whiskey has a flavor. There's somebody that works for that company whose sole job is to be able to maintain the taste from year to year to year to year by being able to say uh, we need a little of from this and a little from this and a little from this to make it taste like it's supposed to which is kind of a crazy thing to think about to have like that advanced of a ability to taste a specific whiskey but um, so in this case a single barrel is exactly how it sounds comes from a single barrel and usually they put a little more time, effort, and energy into those single barrels because there is nothing to try and mix with. So, long story short, John J. Bowman, single barrel. That's is what, what we're trying to do tonight. tonight. Yep. But to answer your question about dog food, uh, we feed Yukonuba large breed puppy food. And I know you have a Brittany, and people will sometimes argue that Brittany's aren't necessarily a large breed or even argue that short hairs aren't necessarily a large breed, but they're definitely not a small breed. I would consider a small breed something like a Chihuahua or a Yorkie or a, you need a pocket knife. Yeah, oh, you I got, got it. I just had to make a lot of noise over there. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, and also, I think it also has to do with energy consumption and levels because these sporting breeds use a lot of calories. They use a lot of fat. They lose, use a lot of protein to um, maintain good, healthy body weight. And so I would suggest that you can a large breed puppy food, even if a Brittany might not necessarily be considered a super large breed. The other thing to keep in mind um, is, because I saw another comment down that um, they keep eating poop, so you're not sure if they're getting all the nutrients they need. So yes, a high-quality dog food will be really important so that they are getting everything that they need, but also um, do your pop thing. That's a lot of fun. And I put up with him most days. I appreciate it. Uh, But, well, you just make me lose my train of thought. You're just constantly a distraction. Not that kind of distraction. (sighs) Anyway, um, so eating poop can be, you know, not getting the necessary nutrients that they need, but also volume. Um, I don't like to say you need to feed your puppy more or less until I can actually see body condition because we want to make sure that the puppy's not overly fat because getting too much weight on a puppy isn't a good thing. But we also want to make sure that they are um, not too thin either because that wouldn't be healthy and that can drive them to want to try and eat everything, including poop. Uh, So... Our German short hair pointer puppies, starting at around eight weeks old, are eating one cup of food in the morning, one cup of food in the evening. As they get to that 12 to 16 week mark, it's increasing to one and a half cups to two cups in the morning and one and a half cups to two cups in the evening. Um, so then they usually stay at that two cup mark until we switch them to Yukonuba 3020. So I hope that that helps answer your question. Definitely, if you have other questions or want our opinion on whether your puppy's got a good weight, you can reach out to us and we can get you some more information. Okay. Back on the bourbon wagon, well, I guess. Ba- back on the bourbon wagon. I mean, this is just part. Of- so I-, I am going to say, I'm going to throw this out here right now. For those of you that enjoy like bourbon and with with a, like a hint of bird dog in there, or at least the combination of both. Um, this is a little plug into the other stuff. I talked about it. I mentioned about it a little bit ago. I'm starting another channel. It's uh, the guy with the pink gun. It'll probably, 
I, I'm still, I'm up in between, and maybe you guys can help me with this this evening. Which do you like better? We either going to call it Pink Gun Productions or Pink Gun Films. So it's a channel solely for the guy with the pink gun, Pink Gun Productions or Pink Gun Films. That's kind of what I'm stuck between a little bit. But let us know what you guys think in the comments below, and yes. maybe you guys will influence his uh, channel name. Yeah, no, no guarantees, but I'm going to do that for you. It's like uh, when you had the mic like that, it, it takes the, there's not enough cable in it. It was like bending the cable in half. Eh. Okay, so Pink Gun Productions or Pink Gun Films. Tell me, tell me what you're thinking there, how, what you're feeling. But in that specifically, we will be doing, and as often as I can, get somebody to... And when he says we, he means he. I will be doing, as often as I can get somebody, a Bourbon and Bird Dogs episode. It'll be a podcast as well, somewhere in the vicinity of 30 minutes to three hours. I'm feeling a little Rogan-ish here. Um, but uh, we sip bourbon, pick something new, do some samplers, so on and so forth, however the evening strikes us. And BS about bird dogs and stuff. So that will be a thing. Now, for those of you who wanted to know if the bourbon is good tonight, this is absolutely fantastic. Okay? This is uh, probably falls into the top, mm, I'm going to go top 10% of bourbons that I have ever popped and tasted. Um, and it's a, it's a reasonably priced bourbon. If you can find it, it runs about Forty-five to fifty-five dollars, depending on where you're going. It's not some of the stupid like three, four, five hundred dollar crap. This is forty-five, fifty-five dollars. I mean, which is a reasonable, above-average bourbon price. So it's smooth. It's hundred proof. It's delicious, folks. I was already looking right here to just be able to tell you where you can go find it online. And I found it. They have it right here. I'm going to throw this in as a comment and we'll pin it so you guys can, if you're interested, you can take a look. Are, are you done with your whole bourbon spiel now? Can we move on? I think we got a We got a chat. super chat. So, yeah, heck yeah. Um, but it was just $5 with no question. So uh, I don't know if you meant to ask a question with that. Um, thanks for the super Russian chat. Russian Pritium, but... Yes, if you didn't, thank you for your support. If you did, I am sorry that it didn't show your question. Pen message. I penned it, y'all. All right, what have we... Uh, pink Fun Productions. I it think rolls it, better. I think that it was just a typo because G <laughs> is very close to F on a keyboard. Uh, several people say Pink Gun Production. I think they see that. I liked the alliteration myself, but, you know. PGP? PGP and Pink P Gun Productions. So, I don't think that's an alliteration. Pink pun productions, then. Uh -huh. There's your alliteration. Uh -huh. Smarty pants. Um, okay, so let's move on to another question from Lil Mar. Yawa, do you guys keep puppies from your litters, or do you get other puppies from other breeders? Also, how many litters do you have a year, and what was the largest litter you've had? Love the videos. So... We kind of do a little of both. Uh, we do keep puppies from our breeding program. We are, you know, making those choices on how to breed and what dogs to match up and pedigrees and things like that because we're trying to produce a specific type of dog. Um, like we've talked about in other videos, not all dogs are created equal. Not all German short hairs are created equal and different breeders differ differ and breed for different traits. So yes, we keep puppies from our program to add to our breeding program. But when you do that, you have to be sure that you aren't breeding yourself into a corner to the extent that you can't breed anything back to anybody because they're all grandma, grandpa, mom and daughter, son and grandson and things like that. So uh, we also do look outside of our kennel once in a while for dogs. Um, Grit, for example, she's from Black Ridge Kennels. Um, she's about ready to pop, man. She is getting big, and she's from outside of our kennel. And then Quest is also outside of our kennel, but was bred to Vex. So she's half not our kennel, if you will. Um, <clears throat> I think I can... 
I don't know if how interested people would be actually to look at pedigrees because I can add I can add in a second thing that we can switch over to show a computer screen. Like I think we should set thing. up a pedigree podcast because people have asked about it before and there's so much information and we don't have everything set up that I think that it would get it would get lost this time. But yes. if it's something y'all are interested in, I'll figure out how to do it so that we can just like, boop. Now, look at this uh, pedigree, and we'll kind of explain what we're talking about with, in regards to uh, three big factors, right? Which is the coefficient of inbreeding. Unique dogs. Unique dogs. And then relation or percentage blood, basically, which is kind of an interesting combination of the above. It's one of those things that you... Essentially, you you can look at an ancestor based on how many times he repeats. It would be percentage blood more than a grandparent, even though it's like a great great grandparent or something to that effect. And I can show you some specific examples that would make more sense. But we will do that if it's something. If there's really enough people that are truly interested in pedigrees, you know, start dropping pedigree, pedigree, pedigree in into the comments, and then we'll do. Uh, we'll pedigree do some more talk podcast. About that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and then how many litters do we have a year and the largest litters that we've had? So mm, that mm, number, mm. The, it was still part of the first question. Okay. Well, I then we got reading. a super chat. Kind I of. know. Well, I, they're I, important, folks. I understand, but okay. I started that question and I'm not going to leave them hanging and not answer it. So wah, wah, wah. we usually in the past have had about four to five litters a year. Uh, that's just based on growth and, you know, making sure that we're keeping the right dogs for our breeding program. And Ethan and I are very selective and we weed out a lot of dogs that we go, maybe just leave the cork out. That's, this is such a good cork though. Oh my gosh. I love you. I love you. I heard that. I love the, you. <laughs> yeah, just I keep telling you. yourself that. And, um... But you make me lose my train of thought every time you, like, are screwing around over there. I was trying to do it quiet. I didn't put it up next to the mic or anything. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But as we continue to be selective in our breeding program um, and continue to make choices, we have included a few other dogs that should be upcoming for our breeding program so that number of litters can increase gradually. Um, so I think this year we have seven litters planned which is a, two more litters than we had last year yeah. Uh, because we have some younger dogs upcoming as part of the program that have made the cut. So Guts is one of them, for example, and so she will be bred. What? It says you guys are so married. <laughs> <laughs> we are. We are. Um, unfortunately, I can't sit too much further away from him or we won't be in the same shot, so... Um, and I haven't told her yet that I figured out how to set up multiple cameras. So we could actually sit, sit all the way at the, the other, other end. We could sit in the other room if I could get perfect. a long enough cable. Um, and the largest litter is probably Maggie's litter. 13. Yeah, 13 puppies, which is a big litter. So It's a big litter. I've heard some insanity about like 17 puppy litters and stuff. We have not had that. No. So, which is good. I would hate that. On to the super chat so that I don't get in trouble from you. Go, go, from go, go. Halt 250R. Uh-huh. 12-week-old GSP is doing great with kennel to his bed or crate. Also doing good on the here command. Touch his nose to hand. What is next to build duration on place training and better recall? Um, 12 weeks, right? Yep. I mean, you you are rock, you are knocking right on, on collar cusp. condition door. Uh, we started collar conditioning with Quest at closer to 16 weeks, but some puppies that are a little more... You mean tricks? Who did I say? Quest, her mama. They're basically the same dog. I've called her Quest multiple times because she is so similar to her mother. Questy pup. Um, yes, 100%. Tricks. We started at 16 weeks. We have started some others with vibrate conditioning a little bit earlier than that, depending on their... Um, kind of their personalities yeah. as well as their um, pushing the envelope. Sometimes puppies will show you that they are ready for more and ready for a challenge for by kind of being naughty. And Trix hasn't really been that way. So she's been super easy. So yes. it's been easier to push off her collar conditioning to anything until she's been a little bit older, which is completely normal and fine as well. But <coughs> went down the wrong tube. Just a little bit. <laughs> want, want a glass? 
drink of water? Yeah, that'd help. Um, but Thank you. you are really close to that point where you can start collar conditioning, which is <clears> going <throat> to help you build consistency in those distracting situations and also build on duration. Because we did a free shaping video. I got to do this real quick. Sorry, Colin. That's not how it works. I'm going to put you in timeout. That's a thing. Oh. Repetitively asking the same question over and over, commenting. <coughs> um, we'll get you put in timeout for a little bit because everybody wants their questions answered and just repeating it a million times isn't how it happens. If you are spamming, dying... Spamming the, the message service. Yeah. yeah. So if you are dying to get a question answered and you just really want to jump the line and get it answered, put it in a super chat and we will get to it. Like Ethan said, hey, there's a super chat on the top of there. Answer that. So... Um, to find, to finish with that yeah. though. Yeah. So the, we had a free shaping video that we were trying to build on duration with tricks and it just, we could only get so far with that positive reinforcement free shaping. And ultimately we do need that reinforcement based training with the caller to hold her accountable and keep her there. And I will tell you what, in a very short amount of time, our lives got a whole heck of a lot easier because we were able to keep her on that dog bed. She wasn't racing around, getting into things. She wasn't yes. wrestling with the other dogs. It just added a lot of calmness to our household, which 100%. was necessary. 100%. So you are very close to that, and that's where I think you should be headed very soon. So, Yes. So a couple of them here. Next, Super Chat from Ohio Catfish Chasers. Heck yeah. I have trained older GSPs before, but getting my first GSP as a puppy. Which of your series to watch from puppy to adult? Thanks. Upland hunting. So we have a couple different puppy training series. Uh, some of them include labs like Sprig and Clutch. But with a GSP, we have Quest series, Rogue series. Um, we have some fill-in-the-blank pieces with some of Thunder's videos, some of Trix's videos. We have a really, really old series with a puppy, Mac, which was before we even had super good quality oh, yeah. video equipment. Ugh. and um, It looks bad, but the information is good. Yeah, so and some of the audio isn't super great either. But the reason that we have so many options is because not all puppies are the same, and they don't all train the same, and they don't even follow the same path. Typically, we collar condition puppies to recall first. With Trix, we actually collar conditioned her to go on a dog bed first for different reasons. So what we typically suggest is go to our playlists and then watch a couple of the first videos from each playlist and see which personality and which um, temperament kind of jives with the puppy that you have and then try and follow along with that. If you're struggling, you can always search in YouTube, Standing Stones, place training or standing stones recall and it'll pull up every video we've done on those specific behaviors and it may be from multiple different playlists and then you can kind of pick and choose what video to watch there if there's a specific area you're struggling with absolutely absolutely the next one here says uh can you teach a bird dog chickens are not prey i'm gonna say first of and all and that's from justin and kathy hansen yes i'm gonna say first of all uh yes and and no okay so it depends a little bit on the dog are they raised with the chickens 100 percent or not and with all of those things being said a, a buddy of mine he's got um a lot of chickens, a lot of ducks, a lot of, uh, I think, turkeys, depending on the time of year, kind of likes uh, the the ability to run the farm, if you will, and have food and know where it came from, and it's, uh, it's really cool. It's a lot more work, I tell you what, than I probably have time to put into, but, I mean, he's even had goats and milk goats for a while, and they did all, all of that. He's got pigs and all of the things, right? So... Um, his dogs are short hairs that he got from us and, and a couple cockers in there. But the, the thing, the thing behind it is they know how to behave. And if they have collars on, they know how to leave the birds alone. But if they get the opportunity to sneak down to the pen to try and grab a chicken or a duck that's walking around the road or whatever it is, 
it's probably going to happen still. And that's where prey drive is going to kick in. They can learn how to behave and that that's not okay. But if they get the opportunity to say, eh, maybe I should try it or I don't have the collar on and I've learned I can get away or whatever, you're probably still going to struggle just a little bit. But all of that being said, they can learn, they can learn pretty well. So it just depends on your situation. I mean, do you have a, a big yard, a big area, or is it pretty much? Um, no, Kelly, I'm just going to say it right now. No, 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 no. I do need goats. So, he has pigeons. I need goats. And <laughs> if he even tries to say, well, if we got goats, I would just be the only one taking care of them. I help him with his pigeons. So I'm just saying. You, you have it's helped. Teamwork. I appreciate it. Yep, I appreciate it. We should get goats. <sighs> be expecting goats within the next one to two years. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, to finish that, though, yes, you can teach it. It's going to be a struggle. Uh, I mean, they, they are prey-driven animals that want to hunt those chickens. I'm just going to – it's going to be tough, but it can be taught. It can be done. I really thought you were going to tell a funny story about a turkey. Ha! Uh-huh. You, you know what? I really should. <laughs> I don't know if he's on here, and this Probably would be not, like so a shame on him for not. But um, here's the deal. So I'm up there hanging out. Buddy works uh, ER shifts, and he's like, who? What are they? I don't know. Whatever it was, he had to work nights. When I was there, well, his wife and I are hanging out in the evening while he's at work. And, um, I said, I'll help. I'll let the dogs out. Right. And she's like, Oh, well, you gotta be careful. They like to chase. I'm like, come on now. It's a couple of cockers. I can handle this. I'm a dog guy. Brr. And well, uh, sure. Sure enough. The little cockers ran down and caught a turkey. Okay. Not they had just a little, a turkey. they had a group of turkeys there. What were there? Five, six turkeys. I don't know, maybe a flock eight. Of turkeys. They had a flock of turkeys. Is that a thing? Is it a is it a flock or is it a gaggle? No, uh, gaggles g- geese. A uh, flo- Is flock it a flock of, of turkeys? I'm going with flock. Okay, look it up. Anyhow, I don't care that much. <laughs> it's a, a flock of turkeys. Group okay, of so turkeys. we got we got a flock of turkeys. They're hanging out and they hang out just same as the yard geese and the ducks and the chickens and whatever. But the turkeys, um, I. Uh, this turkey comes back to me. The cocker, one of the cockers, caught the turkey, brought the turkey back to me, and as the turkey's coming back to me, it's the turkey that he, my buddy, had banded. He had put a big band because on it, it because his it was favorite. his favorite turkey, whatever that means, but it was his favorite turkey. And I um, I got the, the turkey away from the dog. The turkey did not make it, uh, as far as I know. But I took the band off of the turkey and put it on another turkey so that he wouldn't know that his turkey was gone. And that his dog friend let his dog do it. So dogs will be dogs, even little prey-driven cockers. So that's the funny story that goes with that. Absolutely. So William Chesson, thanks for the super chat. A rafter. R-A-F-T-E-R. I, I'm going to oh, have to fact check you, John, or Jen. Rafter of turkeys. Jen, excuse me. I'm so sorry. Jen, I'm going to have to check you. A rafter of turkeys. I'm going to look that. I, I want to look Ethan's quick. now curious enough that he's going to look I am curious enough, but thank you for commenting. How can I keep my Brittany from barking inside? He never used to until my wife got a small dog that barks at everything. I don't mind if he barks outside, but not inside. Well, if the small dog's barking, and that's a encouraging. Rafter. Or a flock. Says interchangeably, but a rafter oh, is is we were an actual both right. Name. I like it. That's awesome. Thank you very much for coming. Learned something new. All right, so keeping the Brittany from barking inside. Okay. They've got a little dog that barks. Um, so that's going to escalate. It, it happens in the kennel. If we get mm-hmm. one dog that's just like won't quit barking, the other dogs think that it's time to join in. They just get excited and wound up, and it escalates. So, you know, having. The same expectations for both dogs would really be the fair thing to do. Um, So redirecting their focus, getting them thinking about something else instead of whatever they're excited and interested about barking about. 
Um, but ultimately you can utilize a bark collar, which is perfectly timed correction for the behavior of barking that you want to go away would yes. be another alternative option. hundred percent. So bark collar is going to be a good option. Because it's going to be, like I said, perfectly consistent timing, and it's going to happen every time the barking is happening, not just, and they're wearing the collar, of course, not just if you're in the room using like an electronic collar as a manual bark collar, because your timing is not going to be quite as perfect as that bark collar would, as well as if you aren't in the room or the transmitter is not in your hand, it's going to be a lot easier for um, your timing to be off and the correction to not happen, and I guess correlate in their brain what they're getting corrected for. Now, the one thing that I can say about the bark collar is if you you utilize it preemptively, right? You've got to outsmart these dogs in a sense of predicting when the, the problem is going to happen and preparing for it. So in the kennel specifically, we utilize bark collars on a regular basis. And how we utilize them to predict when the problems are going to be is we know and recognize and understand the dogs are going to bark when it's time for feeding or it's time for a let out or if it's time for, I mean, that's the brunt of it. That's when we're inning and outing yeah. and stuff's exciting, right? Sometimes when you're grabbing other dogs for training sessions, they get FOMO and they don't want to mm. miss out, but that's... It can be settled down with a, hey, 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 quit, grump at them a little bit. Especially hey, the way our kennel is set up now because they don't have to, they're in their own space. Yep. And they don't have to sit and watch other training sessions, indoor training sessions happen, which all the dogs typically seem to have FOMO and then they want to be also training. So they tell you about it. So the example specifically is we know approximately the timing that we're going to do a let out, right? So in and out of the kennel runs in our facility the dogs are pretty quiet. I mean, occasionally a dog gets worked up, but it's for the most part, the dogs are pretty quiet. So we go through and then it's like, all right, well, it's a, it's about time to do the let out. So we go around and bark collar, bark collar, bark collar on the dogs that are really noisy or consistently noisy, preemptively setting them up for success by preventing them from continuing this cycle. And then we go about the business. And as you're doing that, then you can, you can create a new habit or a new cycle. Like you, you break the, the rotation or the cycle and then start the new path. So it allows them to understand, Hey, I, I don't need to bark during these times. And when they aren't getting everybody riled up, then most of the other dogs are also quiet. So it's, it, it works to everybody's advantage. Good question. It's a really good question. Okay. Are you ready for another one? Sure. Absolutely. Let's go. Uh, what you got, baby? Oh, this is talking about bourbon. Ooh-wee. Gotta try Whistle Pig Rye, one of their favorite whiskeys. Cat, when you can drink again. <laughs> I'm not a bourbon person. No, I'll tell you, she won't. She won't like it. But the the whistle pig rye, I actually have, and I will tell you, I, I'm not knocking the fact that you like whistle pig rye oh, at sorry. all. They were saying to try wine. They oh. gave me some suggestions for wine. De- <laughs> decoy or duckhorn make one heck of a bottle of wine. Interesting. Now you're talking. I like wine, so for sure. Um, I personally. Not a huge, 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 huge rye fan because they end up being spicier or a little, um, unless I'm making a drink. And if I'm mixing like a mixed whiskey drink, rye, I'm all about it. So, hey we got some. We got a super chat going on. Yeah, baby. From Jake, any tips on water retrieves? My nine-month-old GSP does great on land or water where she can touch, but anything over her head she won't do. Thanks. So... First of all, I don't know exactly where you're located, but for us, that water temperature is just a little cold still. Literally two weeks ago, our entire pond was one giant 10-foot rock of ice. Yeah, so um, keeping... 
track of the water temperature will help because uh-huh. it's going to be a lot more comfortable for the dogs to get into the water when it's nice, uh, as well as one of our number one tips and tricks to help get yes. your puppy in is for you to get in with them. And if you aren't comfortable getting in the water, now granted you can put boots on or waders on or whatever, but if you aren't comfortable to get in the water, I'm going to go out on a limb that a puppy shouldn't be introduced in that water temperature. Yeah, and it's awesome that they already have some excitement about splashing around, getting their feet wet, Mm -hmm. Um, but it's usually with puppies, if they're lacking a little bit of confidence, it's that breakover point where the bank is gradually getting steeper, and then they realize that they're going to lose their footing, and they're like, nope, turn around, turn around when possible, and they don't (laughs) want to... um, Cat made a joke, folks. Throw some love in the comments It doesn't happen very often. Oh. Uh, so we definitely want to help them build confidence. No pitching them in, things like that. If you have other dog friends that like to swim, bringing them out and having them have that opportunity to swim with your puppy and show them, hey, look, it's great. It's fine. It's okay. There's nothing to be worried about. Um, that would, is the ticket. Would definitely help. Um, and then building some drive and desire with bumpers, even potentially birds. We use some bird retrieve sometimes to get them just to think so much about that bird that they're not thinking about their hesitation of swimming. Um, and that just will break them over that point. And typically, once they've broken over uh, once, twice, it just gets easier and easier each consecutive time. And then they don't even think about it. So hopefully that answered your question. Mm-hmm. Next super chat question from East Base Signing Services. All of stitches are out. Yay. Good. Excellent. We need to start the retrieving in water steps. How would we start that intro, or is it time for upping our Patreon? Love how married you both are. Well, thank you. Um, So refer to my previous answer of some tips and tricks to help get your puppy in the water. Um, Get Olive comfortable getting in with her, using bumpers, maybe getting some birds to try that. A nice gradual bank is also key. Those really deep, steep drop-offs are intimidating for a lot of dogs because they lose their footing really quickly. And if they dunk themselves, they are typically a lot less likely to want to re-enter the water again. It can be a pretty major setback. I mean, it's a traumatic experience. That's why we say no pitching them in. Nah, it would take a special kind of dog for that to not to screw up. Yeah, so... Um, and special in a way that the average person wouldn't want to probably have them around. It's just like nothing. Yeah, try starting with that and see how it goes. I mean, she's pretty driven and pretty excited for those retrieves and things. So then if you're struggling, yeah, sure, up your Patreon level, and we would be happy to help you through Patreon. So if you guys don't know, Patreon is our online dog training community Mm -hmm. where we can help you with questions specifically with training struggles um, through videos that we watch, phone calls, even live videos that we set up a live video chat basically to watch a training session and jump in and interject when timing is right. And if you're on the edge when you look at it and you think, all right, the live is the most expensive tier, but I don't need that or do I need that or is it worth it? We have pretty much anybody that's in the live tier um, has told me if you need a reference for somebody that's on the edge about the live tier, I will 100% volunteer my time to tell them how worth it it is to be able to 100% have you with your eyes on my training session saying, okay, that's perfect. Stop that. Keep going with that. Don't do that anymore. So on and so forth. So it's, it's just a matter of having a pro watching you train your dog and helping direct you. I mean, don't, you don't have to feel you know, like, oh, they're going to see what I'm screwing up. I mean, that's what we're here for, but we're going to help you in a way that's, that's Yeah, helpful. and we're not going to be judgmental. We're not no, going to make fun of you. that was the word I was looking for. We're yeah. not going to judge you. We're here to help. I mean, if you were all professionals, you wouldn't need us, so. Yeah, and we all had to start somewhere, so. Absolutely. Don't feel like we would be making fun of you at Patreon. all. Patreon.com slash Standing Stone Kennels. 
So a couple more super chats. One was from Charlie Lott, but he didn't ask a question that I can tell. So we say thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Charlie. We appreciate the... Yes. I, I looked at that. Oh, I was looked. trying to okay. figure out if we were missing it or something. Okay, perfect. Thank you, oh. Charlie. We appreciate it. It says message was retracted. I don't know what that means. Oh, well, un unretract your message, Charlie. We'd be happy to answer it. Yeah. Um, from... Oh, Red here, 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 here. Where do we go? More info, more info on my question. We have oh. a Rufflin kennel with a Mud River insulated cover for when it's cold. Also, Pat, let's see. You answer the next one. I'll look for the rest, for of, the rest Charlie's. of Charlies. For the rest of Charlies. Okay. Because it's in here and somewhere. And Russian Predium, he was who had given us an initial super chat, and he didn't have a question with it. So this is the question. What is a good food for a nursing mother? So we actually feed Yukonuba. 30, 20 to our mothers when they're pregnant, when they're nursing. And we typically watch again, their level of milk production and their body condition. And our mamas, especially with bigger litters, typically eat quite a bit of food um, because they're producing a lot of milk. And uh, that's one thing that we really like about Yukonuba is how much milk production our mamas really have. Uh, we used to struggle, I felt like with moms having enough to produce for litters and we were doing a that's, ton of supplementing. That's 100%. I mean, that's that is 100%. And it's it's not a bashing thing, okay? There's a there is a no one dog food that is perfect for every dog, but I'm telling you right now, the Yukonuba performance dog food is what I feel like is best for our dogs. And that milk production thing is was insane to see. I mean, moms a few days to a week beforehand are just dripping milk everywhere. They had so much milk production. It was insane. Maybe I need to eat Yukonuba dog food before our baby's born. Just kidding. But not really. Like, I would take any extra help to get my milk to come in sooner than well, I can. Well, we've got the Ninja. I mean. Blend that stuff up. Make a protein shake out of it. Delicious. Why not, right? Uh, plug your nose. All right, I found Charlie's question. You get through okay. that one? Yep. Awesome. Okay, so it says, Yawa, what are safe temperatures for dogs to spend the night outside in their kennel in the truck, for example, when traveling? I have a two-year-old black lab, and I want to know when he needs to be inside. More information on my question. We have a Rufflin kennel with a Mud River insulated cover for when it's cold, also a pad inside the kennel. Okay. So this is a tough one, and it's a tough one. But it's one. a good one because it's we a get great asked one. a lot. Yes, it's a it's a great, 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 great question, but it's a tough one. There is a huge difference between will survive and is ideal, okay? Dogs will survive pretty dang cold temperatures, especially if they're out of the wind, they're off of the actual cold surfaces with that pad, right? And then you have that insulated cover. It's going to help, but... I just want to say right now, there's a huge difference. And I'm I'm going to tell you, if it is below 30 degrees outside, I don't want my dogs outside. I mean, even in the 40s, I would rather them be, you know, like optimal temperature for a dog uh, is like 62 degrees to 65 degrees, somewhere in that vicinity. And which is 65 degrees is what we set the kennel at and people look at us. And I mean, there is some climate acclimation that has to be there. If you keep your dogs in a 70-degree environment and then pitch them out into the cold, well, they don't get to wear thermals and a jacket and an extra jacket because it's a little colder today. They need some acclimation, and they can handle that. Yeah, so it's a really big change. Same with in the summer. In the you summer, know, if yep. you've got it set at 65 in your house for comfortable cooling temperatures, and then they go out and have to work when it's 70, 80 degrees or hotter. Sure. That's a huge shock to their system. So so acclimation is important. And there's um, actually, it's an interesting thing. It's a, it's a veterinarian report letter thing for if you're shipping dogs, depending on the time of year, they have a, a letter certificate. Of is it a letter or is it a certificate? Letter. Letter of acclimation. And the vet says the dog is acclimated to temperatures of your... Da, 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 da. So it's important. So our kennel in the summer is set at 80 degrees and it stays warm in there, but that isn't as big a shock to them when they go outside and it's warmer than that. And it, it really helps with that acclimation to tempers, getting used to things. It, that warmer weather helps them to push out and shed winter coats 
and the same in reverse. If we keep it too warm in there, they won't build a good enough coat to be able to be acclimated for outside temperatures as well. So all of those things are important. I'm not going to give you a specific number because there's too many factors involved. If you have harsh winds, if you're not protected, if anything changes from a standpoint there, but I'm going to tell you if it is close to freezing, it's probably too cold no matter what you have going on outside. Now, the only caveat to that would be, I would say, our trailer, if you have a trailer or a box, a dog box of some sort, and they are on that pad, it's insulated, but the whole area is combined so that you have multiple dogs. Let's say, like my dog trailer, six dogs in it, right? You close all the vents down on that, they're out of the wind. That thing is like a sauna inside of it because they're creating heat. Now, the thing that you have to keep in mind, when dogs are exposed to those elements and they are keeping the heat, they are burning the calories like a mother trucker. That's okay? what I was going to say. The, and the shivering and additional it will food warm that it up going in to there. need yeah, to maintain It will warm body it up weight. in there, but it is cold and they are burning all the calories. I'm talking all the calories, and you're going to have to go from, oh, we maintain on three cups of food to six cups of food isn't helping anymore. And to think about, like, their comfort level and, you know, how restful that sleep really is. If you're on a hunting trip or something like that, they might not be tip-top ready to go shape, you know, the next day because they've been shivering all night long and yep. uncomfortable. So my go to is keep them inside. As long as I can keep it above about 45, 50 and they're out of the wind, you're going to have no issues. But if you're below that and you've got any amount of wind involved with it, it's not going to be good. Yeah. Try and find a hotel that you can bring them in with you. Now, remember, I said there's a big difference between can survive and is ideal. And ideal is what we try and work with because our athletes canine athletes are are just that and they need they need taken care of for so. sure we have to be their advocates 100 percent. so next super chat is from sir panther mm. getting a gsp pup in four weeks any tips for introducing her to our indoor cat cat is six and got on well with our previous dog rest in peace euclid well um, getting a puppy and introducing a puppy to a cat is going to typically go a little bit easier than introducing an adult hunting breed to a cat, just because, um, if they've never been exposed to those small little animals before, those cats can really kick up their prey drive because they are a small little furred prey driven animal that that dog may want to chase, catch, and do other things with. With a puppy, they can definitely learn what proper interaction is. And it's similar to having that puppy learn what proper interaction is with another dog in the household. You can't play rough with them. We need to redirect your focus. You can't, um, you know, tease them constantly. You can't bark at them, things like that. So they can definitely learn to get along well, especially if your cat's already had exposure to dogs. They're going to be a little more understanding, but puppies are a lot, so you definitely need to advocate for your kitty, too. Yeah, you, you, you always have to advocate for both. I yeah. mean, whether it's an adult dog or another puppy dog or a different breed dog, the cat. Now, we had one cat that we utilized as the puppy trainer, um, Frisky. Frisky <laughs> was a little asshole, okay? I mean, Beep! <laughs> Beep. Sorry, it's live, folks. Um, he was a little butthole. Sorry for any young children that are listening. Um, he was not a friendly kitty, especially towards dogs. Not towards dogs. I mean, he just held his own. And what we would do, because we had several cats at the time, and cats' family had cats, and there were a few more cats around, right? Yes. So we would take young puppies, and we'd put them in a dog crate with Frisky, and the, the puppy <laughs> this would- This just sounds terrible. It sounds yeah. like we are, like, torturing. The cat and the dog. We were it's not. not like it went on forever. It was like one or two exposures. Oh, it's just just one is typically all it took. So the dog would be like, "Oh, look at that! It's an sniff, interesting, sniff, fluffy sniff. thing." Sniff, sip, and the, he'd be like, pop, 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 "Pow!" <laughs> and then the puppy would be like, "Oh my god!" And sit on the other side of the kennel, and you go, "Okay, you don't like cats anymore, right?" Yep. And uh, then you yeah, you're done. It's, it's over. It's like similar to snake avoidance. But training. they're like ninjas. It's like, pop, 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 pop. Before you even know it, the dog's been hit 22 times. And you're like, whoa, 
I thought it was only like once. No. Pa, 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 pa. So anyhow, we utilize that. But most cats run or lay down or don't have anything that really helps that way. Most of the other cats try and run away, which makes it worse. Because the dogs want to chase then because the it's only, exciting. Uh, we had a cat. It was our first pet that we got together. His Fang. name was Fang. F-A-N-G. Yep. And he was vicious. Not really. He was a really sweet cat. And when he learned right away that if you don't run, 90% of dogs don't care. And they'll just come up and, like, sniff you and whatever else. So if he saw dogs coming, he'd just flop on the ground like he was dead. And they would come over and look at him. But there was one time we had a dog in. Uh, maybe more than one time. But for one time I can remember for sure. In Norton. Yes. Yeah. He, when we had some trees there. We don't have any trees here. Um, but he saw this dog coming and there was no flop on the ground. It was like, ah! and yeah, boom, he knew that that tree. dog I had mean, other motives. Yeah. You just tell there was no, there was no flopping on the ground playing dead. He was going to be dead if he hadn't sprinted up, sprinted a tree. up a tree. Yeah. That's for sure. So we have another super chat from C Staffney again, no question, but got the question. I right got here. the question right yep, here. Yep, That's yep, yep, yep. what I was It says, say. uh, Want to know the best all-around DT collar for training and hunting wetland. Love your vids. Thank you, by the way. My wife and I watch all the time. Messed up the super chat. No problem. We, got we found you. you. Yep. So here's the thing. It really depends 100%. This is a horrible answer, okay? But I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you a long answer and a short answer. There are a lot of different options that come in. This is going to be a long answer first. We're going to start long answer first. There's a lot of different options with DT collars. They have um, probably of the ones that we typically use and recommend. They have the MR1100 that comes in black and camo. This is going to be a little bit more affordable unit, um, but it's very simple. It's got three buttons, vibrate, nick, continuous, and it's expandable to three dogs. We use it because it's got a little smaller box on it. We use it for all the puppies pretty much. That's our go-to. Then the 1400 series if you like the if you like the idea of having that rapid access button, it fits on your hand, so you can be hands free and you still have the button that you can hit with your thumb. That's a pretty cool feature. Both of those units are waterproof, can be used for waterfowl. They have black and camo models. That's pretty sweet. Same size collar box, so smaller it's a little smaller box. profile. Yep. And then you you bump up to the next level, in my opinion there. It's the H2O series, and that's the 1820. And that is our, uh, right now, that's our go-to training collar. The unit's expandable to three dogs. Transmitter's waterproof and floats. Collar is a little bit bigger box on it, but it's fully rechargeable. The whole unit where the 1400 and MR1100 named a 9-volt in the transmitter. Now, the transmitters last a long time. I'm talking months. But still, the 1800 series is fully rechargeable. So you always know it's fully charged, if or it's not if you forgot. Yeah, been there. Um, and then you can step up from there to the SPT One series. One thing, too, the 1820 also comes in black and camo. It does, yep. black and camo. Yep, you're right. And then the, the step up from there is the SPT series. Now, that's a three-mile range. 50 levels where the other three models have 16 levels. So you get a little more breakdown there. You get jump, rise, which rise, you hold the button down and it goes from whatever level you're at to wherever you let off the button. That's where it's going to, and it, it climbs about at that tick, 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 tick. I mean, it's pretty quick, right? Yes. So MR or SPT 2420. Or 2422 if you need a two dog. Um, we got another troublemaker. Yeah, he's trying to get somebody to go, all of everybody to go to his channel or something. Oh, yeah. See, a YK gamer. Um, so. And somebody told him to stop. Nobody cares about your channel. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. So, on um, the. SPT 2430, that's like the tip top of the line. And. Honestly, that would be what I would use if it was expandable to three dogs. Now, if you need a single dog, I'm going to say that's going to be the go-to. It's top of the line. If you want the slightly more affordable, because it is the most expensive, you want that slightly more affordable model, the 1820 that's fully rechargeable, that's a go-to. That's the one we use on the daily. So 
My short answer is I'd probably recommend to you 1820 H20 Series 1820 collar. All of those available on our website and some pretty cool news for everybody's listening right now. We have um, standingstonesupply.com. It is just about finished up and it will be going live very soon. So if you see that little bit of change, be aware now. Standingstonesupply.com is going to be the new store. It's going to push everything from that. Even if you go to standingstonekennels.com and click on the store button, Boop. standingstonesupply.com is where you will be. It's got a lot better functions for organization and filtering and finding products, and it's going to be way cooler. Way cooler. So, next. With a capital S- W. Yeah. Way. Is that the <laughs> capital C? I don't know. Anna H. My visa will be two in May. He will carry and retrieve almost anything, but will not pick up birds that are shot over him. So, there's a couple tips and tricks that we can mention. One is you can start introducing feathers and that experience of getting feathers in their mouth by putting some wings around a bumper, taping them up, start with one, throw the bumper, see if you can build some excitement and drive for that. Um, Then transitioning to like a frozen bird that's just a little bit thawed, so it still has like a very bumper-esque shape. And then to a fresh killed bird. And sometimes just using those tips and tricks, especially with a dog that already loves to retrieve, you can bridge that gap of not retrieving birds. Um, If you cannot and your dog just flat refuses to pick up any kind of bird, um, we would recommend our trained retrieve process. We have an entire series on our YouTube channel, which is where you guys are at right now. Thank you guys all, by the way. I hope you hit that subscribe button, by the way, um, if you're here. But um, you can find it under our playlists. It's a trained retrieve series, and it will help any dog that, whether they retrieve now or don't retrieve now, to be able to retrieve any object that they're physically capable of retrieving. So Pretty much. It's uh, the ticket. We did it with um, way back in the day. Go watch the originals. Is if it's even there, just for a laugh, all right? Again, the information is good, but you get to see old me with uh, long, shaggy hair and mutton chops. I and mean, he like, sounds legit. different, even. I was so afraid to say something that was going to piss off the internet. No, ah. your voice even sounds different, I think. I uh, think. Maybe my balls dropped. <laughs> Beep. Sorry, young listeners. Um, <laughs> Well, we were really young. Hello, (laughs) folks. I'm Ethan, and today we're going to talk about... It's bad, but the information, again, is good. If you want the updated version that is more closely related to exactly how we do it today, watch the version with Legend, okay? It's uh, 22 videos, and I don't know if he's still tuned in here, but uh, there's a gentleman that is, I mean... I say, hey, did you see the video? And he's like, yeah, pff, already watched it five times in preparation for doing this training session that he's a patron, live tier, uh, rocking and rolling with his uh, lab right now. So it's absolutely fantastic. Now, we had a super chat from Andrew Cooper, but he missed getting his question in the super chat. Yep, yep I and it. I found okay. it. Yep. And um, that's happened to a couple people. So we're trying to find the questions that you had asked um, or had wanted to ask. So Andrew Cooper said, I have a seven month old GSP and want to send her to formal training. Have you guys ever heard of the Hunt Smith Silent Command system? I'm in South Carolina and there are only a few gun dog trainers. Sorry, messed up the super chat as well. <laughs> Sure. Uh, I'm going to say, first of all, anybody that's in this business from a bird dog standpoint that has not heard of the Hunt Smith method is living under a rock. And I don't mean that in a wrong way. I mean that in the fact that those guys are like the pioneers of dog training They've and teaching people how to train dogs. A while. I mean, Delmar, he's such a sweet old man. Um, he, you know, you see him at all the events. He's flirting with all the young ladies. All they wanted, I mean, he's, I don't know. I'm going to make this up because I have no idea. But he looks like he's about 100. And he's got every, he's like, come get a picture with old Delmar, you know. And um, s- nicest guy in the whole world. Doesn't know anybody from Adam, me especially. But you walk up and say, hey, 
and he's just happy to chat with you. You know, I mean, great, 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 great people and have been around for a long time. Now, I have never been to one of their seminars, but I have run into several of them at different events like Pheasant Fest and um, other expos, if you will, that are dog related. But um, it's good. And if you look at, I want to say this not to discredit us, um, but essentially, like, I'm going to, here, wait a second. Um, if you look at the top tier dog trainers in the industry, you're going to see a lot, a lot of similarities. There are some small, minute details that are going to change how their program maybe fits your specific dog differently. Or breed. Or breed differently. Or even just down to the point of like what we typically pride ourselves on that's going to be a little bit different maybe is the the way that we maintain um, the living environment for the dogs. So all of our dogs have indoor-only kennels. It's climate-controlled, and we maintain house training as best as we can through frequent letouts. They go out to go to the bathroom. So they're not expected to go to the bathroom in their space where there are quite a few facilities out there, not all of them, that have outdoor only runs or indoor outdoor runs, but you, they go out, they pee and poop on the concrete. And it's that kind of, it's that kind of environment where we're providing as, as close to a house environment as we can, where you get to go out to go to the bathroom and you don't have to think about going in your space and it makes dogs more comfortable. So um, the other side of it is the level of interaction that we provide with you as a client while your dog is with us. We understand they're part of your family and we want to make sure that you are getting to see and know how they're doing and be available for that. Um, so I think you would see some of those things. But as far as their specific methods, I mean, I think if you watch all any or all of our playlists and training series and whatever, you're going to see a lot of similarities. The best in the business, I mean, there is a lot of things that specifically work for training dogs. Yes, and then and, there's things that don't. And there are things that don't. And the people that are out there, like um, the Smith brothers or Smith family, because there's cousins in there, I think, but, um, you know, they're doing a fantastic job, and they know... And if they, those things. and I was going to say, if they didn't know what they were doing and if what they were doing and how they were training didn't work, they would have washed out. Already. They wouldn't be around anymore yeah, as well been. as they're very well known. And Extreme. as everyone knows, word of mouth is definitely one of the best ways to make or break a business. And if, I would call us 100% the little guys. Comparatively to the the oh, Smith family, yeah, but I'm oh, yeah, saying yeah. word of mouth is going to make or break a business. So if if they don't have happy clients that aren't getting their dogs trained, they are people are going to hear about it. So um, one thing that I would say, they have their wonder lead, the Delmar Smith wonder lead. I believe, and this 100, percent I believe, and this is the reason why we made it and everything else. Our easy lead is a much I'm going to go with better product for a lot of different reasons. That uh, Smith lead, the rope, I mean, I always wondered why dog trainers, I see them on a regular basis wearing leather gloves. Especially on all the like social media channels and things like, like that. like, oh, I got my wonder lead. Well, I need a glove so that the lead doesn't destroy my hand. Um, a big difference in the product yeah, that we Yeah, we created. actually had a training seminar going on. And you and one of the clients had a wonder lead and you were going to just handle the dog and take the dog. And yep, that was a, it was a big eye opener for me because I'm not a big shove, shove our stuff down somebody's throat. You know, you come to our training seminar, and you want to learn how to heal your dog and you have a wonder lead. Fantastic. We're going to utilize that. But it was like, whoa, Bubba, this has worn my hands out. And one uh, dog, you have one dog. So, um, our easy lead, which I absolutely love, and it's more versatile. So that's just a standard slip lead. It's a pretty stiff material. Ours is a head halter, slip lead, and then standard leash for when you're all done with healing. But all right, what do we got We've next? We've got one last super chat from Rishan Pridium. Again, I apologize if I've been butchering your name. Running my pointer with a flushing dog for the first season, is that okay? So we typically recommend that you wait a season to run a flushing dog with a pointing breed because 
that pointing dog is going to have a lot that they're still putting together. They're green. They've just learned all the basics and finally figured out what their purpose and job is out there. And then they're going to end up being, um, what? Nothing. Continue. Sorry for the distraction. Okay. Um, totally lost. Oh, and so they're just putting everything together still in a hunting scenario and hunting is even more exciting than training because there's typically a little less training going on and a little less handle. And we don't want that all that hard work and all that training to go out the window when a little flushing dog comes in and adds that extra level of excitement and distraction to the situation because you're trying to handle two dogs and that flushing dog gets to run right past that. Just figuring out how to be steady pointing dog And then both trying to make the retrieve. Um, Now, there's a handful of really special dogs out there that can handle that level of steadiness at a young age in their first season even. Um, But without seeing your dog and knowing how they went through training, I wouldn't want to necessarily recommend that you do that because I would really hate for all that hard work and steadiness training that you have put into your pointing breed, pointing dog, to not come to fruition. I have two, uh, three. I'm going to go with three fun little statements. Okay. One, you should go watch the video, the strike dog video. If you haven't already. All right. That was sweet. Yep. Yeah. 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 We've got uh, moves figured out. Next thing is, um, what back again, back again is just, we can just remove. No, that removes the comment. Goodbye. It says hide. I don't know if we can just block him or not, but he's just gone again. Put him in timeout again. For It's only for 300 seconds. 300 seconds. Timeout, son. Okay, so uh, two, you should bop over. Do me a favor here. Bop over, um, hit up Lone Duck Outfitters. It's a YouTube channel. Bob, buddy of mine, he's got some uh, really good videos based around retrievers and basic obedience and things like that. Um, Hit them up, subscribe, throw a like in there. Just say, uh, what should we have them type? Just just for fun. Hit up a video. I don't know. Strike dog. Just type a comment. Strike dog. I mean... That's the, the general conversation that we brought this up. So you go on Bob's, just pick one, watch him. The dude's hilarious. I love it. Um, strike dog. Throw that in there. And then the third thing is if you aren't practicing the strike dog or hunting with a pointer and a flusher together, if you aren't practicing that in training sessions and your dog can't handle it, you shouldn't be hunting them that way. If they can handle it in training, hunt them that way. It'll be fantastic. I also think it depends on the dog. Well, it is, but in practice, right, training sessions, if they can't handle it, they shouldn't hunt that way. So that depends on the dog. Yes. But if they can handle it, hunt them that way. It'll be great. Okay. Uh, Also, Scott said, hey, still here. Scott is the gentleman that's that's rocking and rolling through his trying to retrieve formal retrieving work right now, watching Legends series. That's what I zoomed in on a little bit. Yeah, and I think he was also telling us that this guy is still here. He keeps bopping back in, (laughs) and people are telling him to leave, and he's back. I saw another one in here. I wanted to... No one wants to see your dog, gamer. (laughs) Uh, I don't know. We'll have to try and look into how we can maybe block somebody if they won't get the hint by being put in timeout, but... Do we have time for another one? Is that what you're looking for? I mean, this is live. It, I mean, it just depends on folks. We're starting to lose a few folks here. It just depends on what we got. There was one other one that I saw. Let's do one one more, folks, Deal. for this evening. And I saw a question I wanted to answer. Maybe it'll end up being two. Ah, where did it go? Hey, okay, so um, there were a couple pigeon-based questions uh, Brian Turn Turnbow, um, this is what we're drinking this evening. Focus, focus. Okay, so that is it. And the pin at the top is actually a link to a place I found online quick that you could buy it. Um, 
And then it says, thanks for the informative answer. Excellent. Ruby enjoyed a couple days off. Awesome. Awesome. You guys need a chat moderator. I know. Absolutely. And we can make somebody a chat moderator, but we need it to be the right person. It can't be a... Uh, it can't be YK Gamer. It can't R. be YK Gamer R. No. Um, somebody else, and I just want to throw this out there. Somebody else asked about pigeons, specifically a couple questions about how many pigeons to have for training dogs, about how to start. I saw another question bobbed in there about how to start a uh, coop for training pigeons and or a, a loft will teach you verbiage. Um, but to bring a, enough birds together to have homing pigeons to train with. And then somebody else asked if I was entering any of my birds in races. I want to tell you all of these updates I have shot several videos and have several videos in the queue. All of these updates are going to be on what, it, according to popular demand here, will be Pink Gun Productions channel here shortly. Um, I've got several. It's all rock and roll. It's a process. I apologize for the delays, but uh, it will be coming soon, and it will be consistent. Two to probably three videos a week that include stuff that I do, exhibition shooting you know, with a shotgun, Hunting videos, pigeon videos, uh, bird dogs and bourbon, which we already bird heard dogs about. and bourbon. Absolutely, we're going to shoot the first one of those this uh, this weekend. I don't know if he's a hundred percent ready for it, but my buddy Charlie, who is a bigger bourbon snob than I am, is going to be with me to kick this bad boy off the right way. So. Yeah, it's going to be a really fun way for Ethan to be able to share some of his hobbies on his own channel because pigeons, bourbon, I mean, a girl can only take so much. So. Oh, yeah. no, they did it. We got what? one more. We got to oh, do we it. We got one more. Super chats, people. If they keep coming through, we'll keep answering them. Otherwise, this is going to be the last one for this evening, folks. From Brecken Dufek, what age would you start formal retrieving? Okay, so this is a very debated topic. It depends on dog and breed and trainer. For us, it's going to average based on the dog's maturity level. I would say somewhere between 8 and 12 months. We typically err on the side of closer to 12 months, though. Dogs that are a little more mature mentally seem to handle the more formal training better. Now... If you talk to any, I'm talking poll 10 retriever trainers, 9 out of 10 of them probably, if not 10 out of 10 of them, will tell you as soon as those permanent teeth come in, which could be somewhere between 5 and 6 months, that's early in my opinion on what the dogs are learning, but I've also watched formal retrieving work with retriever guys, and it seems a little different. I mean, they're typically, a lot of times, they're utilizing um, an insane desire to retrieve, and they're just kind of getting it done, though. Don't, don't get me wrong. They're getting it done, but it's different, okay? It's different. So um, it really depends on what kind of dog you have and its desire to retrieve and what you're struggling with, but... And I also think that sometimes the methodology and the process is different as well. 100% it is. 100% it is. So if you're following along with our specific trained retrieve series, which we've talked about, there's a playlist for it. That would be something that we would say, hey, that would be that 8 to 12 month mark. You know, split the difference and do it at 10 um, when your dog's a little, 10 months, um, when your dog's a little more mature and ready for that formal training, but that would be a good age to start. If you're following along with someone other's methodology, that they're having success and doing things a little bit differently with a different breed or a different technique, then, you know, they're the expert in that. So absolutely. So for us, eight to 12 months, kind of depending on your dog. And I would say that of the things that we have available to you, Patreon is going to be a big one in that situation. It's uh, formal retrieving work is probably the biggest learning curve of the, you know, kind of standard training that you can do with your hunting dog. So having somebody there to help direct uh, and Scott's on here this evening. He may have just tuned off, but he was one that definitely said he'd be happy to chat with anybody. Um, that live tier gives me the ability to say, okay, right there I can see not enough pressure or do that rep again, do that rep again. Now stop. And then that's, it's, 
I mean, I've literally, I would guess done close to a thousand dogs. It's a, an estimate, but a thousand formal retrieving work, trained retrieves, whatever. Um, and every single one of them has been different. They take a similar path, but it's, it's more key factors that we're looking for to be able to help them advance. And it takes, it takes experience guys. So, um, I think that's all we've got for this evening, right? There was one more question that I wanted to answer because it's just about me. Ah. Michelle Vasquez asked, Kat, when are you due? I'm due May 22nd. So I will um, maybe go a little early. I would be okay with that. Aiden was born at 37 weeks, so a little bit early, and everything was happy and healthy with him. So we will see when May rolls around what day the little dude is actually born. So... Thanks for the question. And before we can leave, <laughs> there's a super chat from Caitlin Anthony. What do we got? What do we got? What do we got? Looking to get into NAVDA, but I'm nervous as this is my first GSP. Any advice? I live in Kansas, by the way. Excellent. We're in Kansas. Throw that in there quick. Yep. Um, as far as getting into Nava, Na- NAVDA. Have another bourbon, babe. I'm, I'm almost done for this evening, okay? Uh, uh, NAVDA. It's uh, it's a really, really, really cool, inviting organization. So don't be nervous. Don't be nervous at all. And depending on where you're at in the state of Kansas, um, there are chapters that you can join, which would be probably my first recommendation. Um, Kansas City area has a chapter. If you're more northern Kansas, you could join the Nebraska Heartland chapter. Um, and there is a chapter yeah, down. North Central. That's kind of close to Lincoln. I mean... Yeah, you might be close. No, 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 no. What what would it be? It's not Lincoln. It would be... Brainerd is actually where it's at. Brainerd is is the closest town, yeah. Um, But the Heartland chapter, I know... Mocan. uh, Yep, and Mocan is the Kansas City-esque chapter, and I would say um, either of those chapters would be great options. I know people from both chapters personally. They're excellent people. They have a ton of experience and knowledge when it comes to training at different levels of those tests. Uh, There are grounds that they typically allow access to for training weekends and getting involved that way. And then also, if you... Just feel more comfortable reaching out to us and asking us specific questions. Um, definitely, you can do that through either Patreon or come down for a consult. We would be happy to help and happy to work with you. Uh, Fort Riley area. Fort Riley would be north of Kansas City Metro. Is that correct? I'm pulling up my Google Maps. I think so. I mean, it's over on the, the northeast corner, right? Yeah, so... No, not quite. So I think it would be approximately a horse apiece if you wanted to go to the Kansas City chapter or the Nebraska chapter. Don't they... Let me see here. They typically were training outside of Emporia, but they've moved... They've moved a lot of their training further east and even into Missouri because it's the Kansas City, Missouri, Mocan. Ah... Yeah, um, so chapter, you are. So. I mean, either look up the Heartland chapter or the Mocan chapter. You are, like Kat said, a horse apiece. A very, uh, very much so. And Rashan just sent but us. But you're a also at Fort Riley. You're, you're not you. very far from us. So. But we don't actually have a chapter here. But we are a good resource as far as coming out for consults and things like that. Yep. So. Thank Perfect. you, guys. And again, thanks, Rashan, for the last super chat. You are welcome. Okay, guys. Ethan's definitely out of bourbon. I'm out of, out of bourbon, time. folks. And we appreciate all of the great questions and all of the support. And we will see you next week. Yeah, I don't. Uh, it probably next week is not scheduled to be live. It's not live, but so we're it will do be a, a premiere, premiere. And we will be available to, to, to chat, interact while it's going on. So if you have questions, go on to YouTube, watch a video, Yawa question, throw your question in there, folks, and we'll be happy to try and include it in next week's Yawa. Thanks, guys, for watching. I'm Cat the Dog Trainer. I'm the guy with the pink gun. We'll see you in the next video.